If asked to name the most influential Hindu, or perhaps the Hindu they most admire, many people, certainly beyond India, would probably nominate Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi. Thanks to Richard Attenborough's acclaimed biopic of 1982, a moving and powerful image of Gandhi and his achievements has been projected far beyond India. Although this film has been criticised for sliding around difficulties that made Gandhi a contentious figure in India. If one were to ask the same question of Hindus, whether in India or elsewhere, their answers to this question might be more varied and influenced by the nature of their relationship to the Hindu tradition. For example, if attached to a guru, devotion might well affect their response. But many might express at least respect and reverence for Gandhi as the father of the nation and for the way in which he lived his life. It is probably fair to say that other Hindu gurus and leaders who have also had a major impact on India and on developments within the Hindu tradition over the last two centuries, and have attracted countless devotees, have nevertheless remained somewhat in Gandhi's global shadow. Although, as I hinted above, Gandhi's life and influence have been re-examined more critically in recent years. In these talks, I shall focus on Swami Vivekananda, who, although far less well-known beyond India, remains a figure of considerable stature in India, and particularly what is now the state of West Bengal and the city of Kolkata, where Vivekananda met and interacted with his guru, Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. The nation celebrated the 150th anniversary of Vivekananda's birth in 2012 and 2013. There were conferences, special publications, special events, and many children dressed up looking to look like Vivekananda. Having now mentioned the region of what during the time of Ramakrishna and Vivekananda was known as Bengal, I should explain that there is no standard system for transliterating Bangla, Bengali the language of that region. Consequently, Romanized spellings of Bengali, as found, for example, in English language textbooks, give little guide as to how Bengali is spoken, its pronunciation. For the sake of accessibility and clarity, as what follows are talks, not articles, I shall pronounce Bengali names and terms in a style reflecting the way they are usually Romanized in textbooks. Through this series of talks about Vivekananda's impact and legacy, and the heated debates that have surrounded assessments of his achievements, I hope you will come to see why Vivekananda remains a fascinating figure. I first encountered his name in the late 1960s in a university textbook as I began my studies of the Hindu tradition. At the time, he was just one in a string of unfamiliar names in an account of 19th century Hindu movements. But there was something that did catch my attention. Vivekananda was still a student when he first met the guru who would transform his life. Also, in the last decade of the 19th century, Vivekananda travelled from India to Chicago, intending to speak at the World's Parliament of Religions, which had been planned to run alongside the World's Columbian Exposition, or World's Trade Fair, of 1893. Still a student, I warmed to the notion that Vivekananda struck a chord with his audiences in Chicago because his reconstruction of Hinduism on this international platform highlighted universalism and tolerance as the characteristics of Hinduism, often in contrast to the perceived exclusivism of missionary Christianity. Why did this intrigue me? Well, of course it was the 1960s, and this seemed to chime with the times. But I was also struck by the fact that not only had Vivekananda adopted the life of a Hindu renouncer, almost as he finished his undergraduate studies, but that he had made what seemed to be the reverse of the journey to India that many of my generation were making some in search of some kind of spiritual religious enlightenment.